today we move on to our new topic, vector computers. So a little bit of uh, introduction on what a vector, vector machine is, or a vector processor. Broadly, it's a way to get at having data level parallelism. Many times for, let's say, array operations, you're going to want to take one whole array and add it to another whole array. And let's say these arrays are large. Does it really make sense to have a processor sit in a tight loop doing load, add, store, load, add, store, load, add, store in a loop? And that's the insight that comes out that if you have computations that work on vectors or uh, matrices or multi, even multi-dimensional matrices, you can think about building an architecture where you don't have to have as much instruction fetch, instruction decode bandwidth, and you don't have to sit there and fetch new instructions and continually operate on those new instructions. You could just have an instruction which encodes some large amount of computation because it's all the same is the insight. Also, in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about single instruction multiple data architectures. This is kind of a degenerate case of vector architectures. And a good example of this is something like multimedia extensions, or MMX, in the Intel processors, um, or Altavec in the PowerPC architecture. Um, the newer thing that uh, Intel has added, and they all call uh, SSE, streaming something extensions. I actually don't know what the second S stands for. Um, and then they also now have something they call uh, AVX, which is even wider. But they can, can basically have continually added more instructions to make the short vector nature uh, uh, better. And then finally today, if we have time, we'll be talking about graphics processing units. So I have some examples here. This is the ATI Fire Pro 3D V7800. And then we have the NVIDIA equivalent, or the in in NVIDIA competitor here, which is the NVIDIA Tesla. I think this is a C075. Um, both, these are both uh, very fast uh, processors. And what's interesting is these started out as graphics processors. So they started out to play video games effectively or to do uh, some sort of rendering of three-dimensional data. So you take in some data, you operate on it, and there's massive parallelism there, lots of different triangles in a, a, a three-dimensional image, for instance, in three-dimensional rendering. And people have this insight that that same processing architecture that is good at rendering triangles might be good at doing, let's say, dense matrix operations also. And we've seen this outgrowth, and we've seen a whole programming model come up around this. Uh, and this is, this is very recent. Um, to some extent, these architectures don't come from the same lineage as in sort of normal processors. They come from, really come from fixed function hardware that was there to design, to, there to render video games and uh, three-dimensional sorts of uh, scenes. So the, the architectures look quite a bit different and the naming is very different. So if you go pull, pick up the manual that tells you how to program one of these things and you come from a computer architecture background, you're just not going to understand any of the words. Um, your book actually, the uh, Hennessy and Patterson book, has a very good table which ex translates from sort of traditional computer architecture words to GPU words. Um, and that makes life a lot easier. Okay, so let's get started uh, looking at vector processors. And let's look at the programming model first before we look at the architecture. So this is the software model, not the, um, not what the hardware looks like yet. So to start off here, a couple things to note is in a traditional vector architecture, you're going to have some scalar registers. And these are the registers like in a normal microprocessor. They just hold one value. And there may be, let's say, 32 bits or 64 bits in width. And then you have a second register file which holds vectors. And when you go to access one of these vectors, it's the same thing as a register file here. If you go to access, let's say, 
vector register three or something like that, you're going to, that doesn't denote one value. Instead, it denotes many values at one time. And typically, I, uh, we have a fixed width here drawn, but typically these things have very long widths. So for instance, something like the Cray processor, the Cray 1 processors, had a maximum vector length of 64 elements, where each element was 64 bits. So it's a lot of data that you're, you're sort of moving around at one time with one operation. And an important piece of sort of architectural or at least programming model uh, hardware here is the vector length register. The vector length register says how many of these elements are actually populated. And we'll see why that's important. But for right now, let's just think of having the vector length register be equivalent to the maximum number of elements in the vector. So think of it as having 64 elements, and the vector length register just says uh, there's, you're always operating on all 64 bit, uh, entries of data in parallel. Now, if we go look at the programming model connected to this, we need to add some extra instructions now. In our scalar processors, or all the processors we've been talking about up to this point, it operates on one register with one other register. And that still exists in this model, but it operates only on these scalar registers. Now, the reason we want to still have the scalar registers around in this model is we want to have things like branch conditions, address computation, things like that are not vectorizable. They don't, you, know, you don't have 64 addresses. Maybe, maybe you do in certain cases, but typically you're not going to have that laying around. You're just going to have an address, and you need to do a load from address. And sort of for branches, you need to do the branching uh, based on some value, and not all 64 values. But we now add some special extra instructions. So if you go look in your book, they develop this architecture they call vMIPS, or vector MIPS. And they add some extra instructions here, which look very similar to normal MIPS, but all of a sudden they put some Vs at the end here. So VV, which means it operates on a vector with another vector. They also developed some instructions which have a V and an S, which is the scalar. So you can do a vector plus a scalar, which would be something along the lines of if you were to have, let's say, a add vector scalar where you're adding one vector with a scalar register where the scalar register, let's say, is loaded with one, you could do this add and it'll increment every element of the vector by one. You also have loads and stores, which can pull out very large chunks of memory and put back very large chunks of memory from arrays in memory. But if we look at what's going on in one of these instructions, we're taking one vector, another vector, putting it into some sort of arithmetic operation, and then storing it into another register. This is a register register vector architecture. There have been some register memory and memory memory vector architectures out there where instead of naming registers, vector registers, you can name places in memory. But the, the vector vector, excuse me, the register register variants are, are the most popular. Just like the register register our com scalar computer architectures are now the most popular. One thing I did want to point out here is we've said nothing about how many ALUs are in this architecture. This is just the abstract programming model. So don't get this confused with having one, two, three, four, five, six functional units or something like that. This is just an abstract model right now. We have not talked about the hardware. So this brings up how do we get data? And we have an instruction here that we'll call load vector. Load vector has a destination being a vector, and the source is a register, and you might have another offset in the register, but let's say there's only one register in our, in our basic load vector operation here. And this is the address that points to the base of the vector in memory. And when you go to do this load, it's actually going to pull in from memory into our vector register. You could also start to think about having interesting offsets or strides here. So that's what this picture here is trying to show, is we have a base pointer pointed to by register 1. It's a scalar register. And note, it has different naming. This is, these have Vs and these have Rs. And then we have a stride here which says where in memory to take from. 
So you could think about having something where you can do basically multiple uh, locations in memory, but you want every fifth element or something like that. So you could load register two here with five, register one here with the base address, and then do this load vector instruction, and it'll take each fifth piece of memory of some data size and load it into the vector register. And this is our abstract model, but at the, at the beginning here, let's, let's assume what's called unit stride, which basically means this here is always one, so it's always getting the next value in a row. We'll, we'll talk um, in more complicated cases about having non-unit stride. Okay, so let's look at what this does to code. Here we have a basic code example. It's going to multiply element-wise different elements of, a, of a, a vector here, A and B, and deposit it into vector C. Now, this is in memory, because this is C code, so these are actually arrays. Now, obviously, this is not a, you know, array multiplication here, because array math is much more complicated. This is an element-wise multiplication. If we go look at the scalar assembly code, well, first of all, we need to have a loop. We have to load the first value, load the second value, do the multiply, do the store. This is uh, showing code for floating point double precision multiplies. And then you have to increment a bunch of pointers, check the, the boundary case, and, and loop around. On your vector architecture, life gets a little bit easier here. Because we can do all 64 of these in one instruction, we don't have to loop. And all we really have to do is load, load, or load vector, load vector, multiply, and store. And this instruction on the top here loads the vector length register. And we load the vector length register here with 64 because we're trying to do 64. But if we were to load the vector length register, say, with 32, we would only do the first 32 multiplications. And you can set that vector length register all the way up to the maximum vector length. So the vector length register, there's, there's this value here we call the vector length register max, which is the width, the, 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 the largest, excuse me, length of a vector. The vector length register says for the given operation we're about to compute, how many of those operations we should do. So you could very easily have something with a vector length of 1,000, but you only want to do, let's say, the first 64 operations. So you can load your vector length register of 64 and only do 64 operations. Um, a good example of this actually is some of the um, supercomputers, cray, cray machines have relatively short vector length maxes, but if you go look at something like the NEC uh, the Japanese supercomputers, the NEC SX8 or 9 or something like that, which is, I think, actually now probably the fastest computer in the world, um, or the SX9, I think, is, or whatever is the, the, the newest. I actually, I think it's the SX9, uh, the new Japanese vector supercomputer. They have very long vector length uh, uh, maxes. So they can actually have a vector length of 1,000. So that in one instruction, they can basically encode 1,000 operations which is pretty, pretty fancy. But they can, you still need to be able to set the vector length because maybe you don't want to do all 1,000 all the time. Okay, so why, where does this vector stuff come in, have some advantages? Well, if you go back to sort of the early vector machines, so something like the uh, Control Data Corp 6600 or the Cray-1, um, they had very deep pipelines. And if you think about our architectures we've been building up to this point, we've had to add a lot of forwarding logic and a lot of bypasses to be able to bypass one value to the next value. Well, if you have a very deep pipeline and you have sort of back-to-back -back multiplies or something like that, you're going to stall a lot. But in a vector computer, because you know you're operating on, let's say, 64 operations at a time anyway, this actually allows you to take out a lot of the bypassing. So a lot of these vector architectures have no bypassing in them. Because if you're going to be operating on 64 things and your pipeline length is 6 anyway, there's no possibility that you'll ever actually have to forward data back to, let's say, itself or something like that. 
the early. Um, you can do all the bypassing between different operations in the register file itself. Also, you know, deep pipelines are good because you can have very fast clock rates. So to give you an example, the um, old Cray 1 had an 80 megahertz clock. Now you might say 80 megahertz, ooh, that's, that's not very fast. But you know, 80 megahertz uh, back in the uh, probably late 60s, early 70s it was very fast clock rate for a processor. I mean, these were supercomputers, mind you, but uh, they were very aggressive. And they could do that because they had deep, deep pipelining. They had lots and lots of logic, and these things were physically large. I had mentioned the memory system, and vector computers have some interesting um, changes that you have to think about in the memory system. One of the things you can do is because you have so many memory operations going on when you do a vector load, you can actually overlap going out to main memory with doing the next load effectively, even if you're doing them sequentially. And most of these vector architectures have many, many memory banks. And what's nice is if you have unit stride, you know that your one operation, your one load's going to go to this bank, the next operation is going to go next to that bank, that bank, that bank, that bank, and you can basically have very good uh, bank distribution or bank utilization. And this is assuming right now that we are actually only doing one memory load at a time. And I have a little note up here that says, okay, well, each load takes, let's say, four cycles um, busy bank time. And you have 12 cycle latency to get out to memory in this Cray 1 machine. Well, on a normal architecture, this would be pretty bad because you'd be stalling 12 cycles, let's say, to go out to your memory system. I mean, that's, that's not the end of the world, but that's, that's not great if you like, have a, a load and then a use, a load, a use, and you just keep going back and forth between those load and use. But in a vector architecture, because we have a long vector length, and we're loading 64 different values, and we know that they're going to have good distribution over many different me uh, uh, memory banks, we can effectively do this one load, and we can overlap the latency in the memory banks with each other. So we'll start one load here, and then one load here, one load here, and if, you know, it has four cycle occupancy on the respective bank, and we have a 64 entry vector, definitely by the time we wrap around and get back to using this bank again, that first operation will be done. So it's a relatively effective way to increase the bandwidth of your architecture and guarantee that you're not going to have bank conflicts. 